Welcome, guys, to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, the most will you can, and on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of mutations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of independence, we go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to actually get the order in order to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do and how the frack we got here. Thanks for listening and uh, hold on. It's gonna be fun. Welcome guys to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host the most will be can and on this show. We simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of mutations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here, how the fact we got here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of the independence, we go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything, and you need to know it all in order to actually, get the, in order to, in order to actually formulate your own opinion, and that's what we try to do here, how the fact we got here. Thanks for listening, and um, hold on. It's going to be fun. All right, guys. Today is date July thirty first, twenty twenty one, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, most will be can on the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. Uh, before I do get started, um, this is a family friendly podcast. However, due to the nature of a lot of things we'll be showing today, um, it is definitely going to be viewer discretion is advised um, because a lot of language will be said. So, uh, with that being said, you're that was not the best way to explain this. Better, you know, advise on what you're going to allow your kids to watch and not watch. In this case, if you are going to watch, just be understanding, graphic heavy and definitely language intensive. Um, you probably should have led with that. But anyway, welcome. So, uh, this is the weekend edition. So, let's go ahead and aside from checking out to see why in the world that most the uh, south and the east of the U.S. are on God's hot plate, we have another thing we have to worry about. The CDC's new guidance tonight for the millions of vaccinated Americans recommending vaccinated people now wear masks indoors in communities where the virus is spreading quickly. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky revealing new and worrisome data, in her words, is behind this new guidance, showing the data from several states in this country showing vaccinated people infected with the highly contagious Delta variant may be contagious and able to spread the virus to others. So she said, even if you're vaccinated, the masks indoors in public in those areas seeing spikes will help protect yourself from those rare breakthrough cases and keep yourself from transmitting to others. And late today, President Biden suggesting a recommendation that all federal workers be vaccinated is under consideration. We have new reporting from the White House in a moment. Tonight, the map here. And as I said, the CDC now recommending that vaccinated people wear masks in areas with high and substantial transmission of the virus. Those are the areas in red and in orange there in particular on the map. And with children going back to school now, they're recommending that everyone in K through 12 schools mask up indoors, teachers, staff, students, and visitors, regardless of your vaccination status. This is to protect everyone. But the CDC tonight saying above all else, get vaccinated because they say this remains a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And Dr. Walensky saying we wouldn't be in this situation now had the vaccination rate been higher saying she fears the next variant, which could be even stronger and one that could really test her vaccines. Tonight, the numbers here, 188 million Americans have received at least one dose. That's 66% of everyone 12 years and older. Dr. Zha is here to answer your questions tonight. Cecilia Vega at the White House and ABC's Eva Pilgrim leading us off right here in New York. Tonight, with new evidence, fully vaccinated people with so-called breakthrough cases can potentially spread the Delta variant. The CDC reversing mask guidance for schools and millions of vaccinated Americans. In rare occasions, some vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant after vaccination may be contagious and spread the virus to others. This new science is worrisome. That spread from vaccinated people not believed to be a serious risk with earlier strains, which is one reason the CDC is now urging Americans to wear masks indoors if they are in an area with substantial or high transmission. 
not only to protect yourself, but to protect others. Now that the CDC has this new data indicating that even vaccinated people can transmit the virus in some cases. The CDC also reversing its guidance from two weeks ago, now recommending a universal masking for all teachers, staff, students and visitors, regardless of vaccination status. The CDC stressing the vast majority of transmission occurs among unvaccinated people, but they are studying clusters of breakthrough infections. When we examine the rare um, breakthrough infections and we look at the amount of virus in those people, it is pretty similar to the amount of virus in unvaccinated people. Late today, President Biden saying a requirement for federal employees to get a vaccine is under consideration. We have pandemic because of the unvaccinated, there's so an enormous confusion. The more we learn, the more we learn about this virus and the development of the the more we have to be worried and concerned. And there's only one thing we know for sure. If those other hundred million people got vaccinated, it would be a very different world. You can get vaccinated if you haven't, and I'm going to be as smart as I've said you are. The president also saying in a statement, we are not going back to last year. More vaccinations and mask wearing in the areas most impacted by the Delta variant will enable us to avoid the kind of lockdowns, shutdowns, school closures and disruptions we faced in 2020. Unlike 2020, we have both the scientific knowledge and the tools to prevent the spread of this disease. We are not going back to that. Today's new mask guidance coming as parents across the country are protesting mask mandates in schools. I cannot stand to see her masked and she doesn't want to be masked. Seven states have banned mask mandates in schools, including Arizona, where students are already back in the classroom. Masks optional. And with the Delta surge, a warning from the former head of the CDC, Dr. Tom Frieden, that COVID cases could soar. We're heading into a rough time. It's likely if our trajectory is similar to that in the United Kingdom that we could see as many as 200,000 cases a day. In Houston, doctors are seeing a repeat of moments like this from last summer's surge. In the last 14 days, we've had a 500% increase in the number of admissions. And in Florida, hospitals overwhelmed. Some doctors pleading for extra staffing. In Fort Lauderdale, the family of 15-year-old Paulina Velasquez says she was planning to get the vaccine when she got COVID. She's now fighting for her life on a ventilator. Paulina's vaccinated mother is experiencing a breakthrough COVID infection herself, not leaving her daughter's side. It was terrifying for me because I said, why me? Why not, you know, why, why my daughter? Why not me? It was very sad. Let's get to Eva Pilgrim with us tonight. And Eva, you heard this point from President Biden today. You also heard it from uh, the CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who said, quote, this moment and most importantly, the associated illness, suffering and death could have been avoided with higher vaccination coverage in this country. They continue to urge Americans to get vaccinated. Yes, David. And adding to that, Walensky said without more people willing to get vaccinated, the big concern is the next variant that might emerge. Just a few mutations away could potentially evade our vaccines. Crazy, isn't it? Yes, that's the thing we had to worry about right now. And uh, again, for all those that are pretty much wondering how it works and how it doesn't work, look, um, I have been saying this since the beginning of getting the vaccine. I myself am vaccinated. I see no problem with it. I think it's helpful. I think it's needed. The problem that we're running into, folks, is that you have a lot of people out there, a lot of people who believe that this is a attack on their rights versus their actual survival. Um, I wish I could honestly make this up just because, again, this is the Delta variant. This is something that, again, is very infective, um, contagious, highly spread, and it's only because, only because we have so many unvaccinated out there. Now imagine you're trying to help people get vaccinated and you get insulted, much less you get laughed at. You do not restore order. I will walk away and we will have to have this conversation. Excuse closer. me, excuse me community transmission of COVID-19 attributable to the Delta variant is now at an all-time high. 
across the St. Louis region. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to hear. I went into the firehouse subs in Chesterfield at 141 and Olive before I came here. And I was not masked to go in. And the 16 year old working behind the counter said, excuse me, sir, you have to have a mask on. And I said, well, I don't have one. Uh, and he said, you have to pull your shirt up over your face. And your <laughs> is, this, is this really what we want? Is this what we want the businesses doing? Sir, I don't want to engage in a debate with you about what constitutes a mask or not. I commend the 16 year old. Yeah, Madam Chair, if you do not restore order, I will walk away and we will have to have this conversation. Excuse closer. me. Excuse me. Dr. Khan, I am running this meeting. I know you I are, Madam give, Chair, but I'm minute, respecting you. Just a minute. You. I'm asking you to restore just a minute. order. I am giving you the respect that you need to answer the questions that this council is asking you. I'm in the middle we of answering the We need to tone it down. Now. We need to bring everything, get the temperature down so that we can uh, have a level playing field here. We are all here trying to do the right thing for the people that we serve. I'm sure you are. <laughs> and we will again ask the audience to please, please be respectful. Thank you. We have done everything that you have asked us to do. And we have played by the rules. We have followed your orders. And yet we are still in a predicament. So something is not working. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> So I, I want to know, because again, the slippery slope is what we're starting here, it looks like to me. So I want to know what, what we did not, what did we not do correctly? We didn't talk to the virus about how it should behave, ma'am. Okay. All right. I don't like to use this thing, but I will. Any other follow-up questions from any other council members? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, we don't want to have to have anyone removed from uh, the audience. This is a public building and we want you to be uh, free to uh, engage in what we're doing, but we will not, we will not tolerate disrespectful behavior. We will not. Yeah, so imagine you're basically trying <laughs> to speak some sense and sit there and you have the entire council say, well, we've done everything you've asked. So why, you know, the numbers aren't changing. The numbers aren't working. So something's obviously wrong. You're the health director. You're going to have to sit there and say, well, ma'am, I can't force people to get vaccinations. I can't force people to get shots. I can't force people to come and get their vaccinations. They're going to cite their personal freedoms or whatever misguided principles they think they have. Imagine you trying to make sense in a courtroom. Well, I'm sorry, not in a courtroom, in a council meeting. And the entire crowd behind you is laughing when you're sitting there saying nothing. You know, unless we do something, the number's going to get worse. And they're, they're cheering. Cheering. Not simply just going, oh, man, we probably need to listen to him. No, they're cheering. That alone should tell you a lot. Even more so, I'm surprised the guy stayed in there as long as he did. Uh, just because of the fact of the matter is, the woman who was running the show seemed to be more concerned about trying to keep order, but you're not telling the crowd who is being awfully unruly or, you know, just pretty much, for lack of better words, being dicks about it, She's not telling them to calm down until well after the guy leaves. And he's a health director. So can you only really imagine you're trying to do the right thing, get people vaccinated by a whole bunch of people, especially the guy was, I walked into firehouse subs and I have a mask on and I had to listen to a 60 year old tell me to put my shirt over my nose. Yes, because again, we have a Delta variant. 600,000 lives have already been lost and more accounting. And just like a certain guy here in Nashville, um, who was Phil Valentine, who, let's just say he wasn't a uh, variant, who wasn't a vaccine supporter, caught COVID. And now his family is sitting there saying, well, you guys should get the vaccine. It is amazing to me how people don't pay attention until it's too late. 
And even now, the man is still, you know, he's still alive on a ventilator. But his brother is sitting there saying, well, when he gets off and he gets better, he's going to be the most pro-vaccine person all the time. Of course, his eyes have been open. And we don't, and I, and I hate to say this, but this is probably going to wind up happening with a lot of these people who are refusing to get the vaccines, who are refusing to listen to science, who are refusing to listen to instruction. COVID will hit them. And I have been saying this about COVID. COVID does not have a very high success rate of survival alone. It does not. I mean, it has taken out young, it has taken out old, it has taken out healthy, it has taken out those whose health is not as perfect. COVID does not have a blueprint on how you survive it. It is literally a game of chance. And I don't know about you, but I'm not about to play a game of chance with my life. You may, it may, it may not, it may, it could work out well for you. It could work out very badly for you. I choose not to play that game. But it's amazing to me that you have a bunch of people out there who will swear up and down that they want to play the game of chance. Ladies and gentlemen, if you play the game of chance, let me tell you something. There is no repeat in this when it comes to your life. You know, if you roll the, you roll the dice on COVID and you get sick, um, there's a reason why they sit there and say, get your family affairs in order at any hospital. Even more so, speaking of hospitals, you would think it would be so easy to convince hospital workers that they also should be vaccinated. Why? They're around sick people. There's a chance they can spread the COVID night. They said they can spread the COVID virus and the, and the possible variants that follow. But I wish I could say this. There are a group of hospital workers that are still wanting not to get vaccinated. I, I wish I could make this up. Many of you have gotten a COVID vaccine. These are four healthcare workers from different hospitals in North Carolina. Why not? We don't know what the long-term side effects are. It also hasn't been proven to be effective. The CDC and many public health experts say that it's more than 90% effective. They do say that. <laughs> that hasn't proven to me to be true. I'm not going to just jump on a bandwagon with something that has not been tested. When you say that it hasn't been tested, it has been tested though. But not to the, if you look at the normal, the normal year span of how long something is tested, it's usually 12 to 14 years before it comes to humans. Across the country, about one in four healthcare workers still isn't vaccinated against COVID. And from North Carolina to Texas to New York, anti-mandate protests are mounting. I don't trust it right now. So is the pushback. This is in the category of give me a bleeping break. Uh, when did everyone get a medical degree? For weeks, we've spoken with many overworked healthcare workers who practically begged Americans to get the shot. What do you tell people who just <laughs> don't believe you? It's frustrating. Not these. They say they're not anti-vax, more anti-mandate. And I'm not comfortable putting something into my body until I am ready. If and when I'm ready to get the vaccine, I will get it on my own accord. I won't be forced. You just don't trust the CDC. I do not trust the CDC. Absolutely not. And that fuels their skepticism. I have the right to question anybody in this country. I want to question. Mm -hmm. You're entitled to your own opinion, but these are facts. Are they, though? Mm -hmm. Are they facts? Yeah. Lester, more than 40,000 people participated in the Pfizer clinical trial alone, but those workers are among the many who are not convinced. Let me tell you something. Um, if those hospital workers were working at a hospital that I that I owned or I or a or a hospital staff that I ran, and I sat there and saw their responses to this, they would all be terminated. And I will tell you why. Because these are hospital workers. They are literally in they are literally considered ground zero for where they can possibly spread or you know get or possibly spread the COVID virus. The COVID the COVID-19 virus. They they they're right literally at ground zero. And I'm going to be honest, it would be very difficult for me as a hospital administrator to have people like that on my staff because they should already be vaccinated. You would think the front line, excuse me, the front line alone, you think they would be vaccinated. And it just, it, it, it betwixt my biscuits to sit there and see hospital workers say, I don't trust the CDC. You follow CDC, pro you, you do realize you do follow CDC protocols every hospital, 
well, I don't, I don't really trust the vaccine. It really hasn't been tested. Again, you're going by the same protocols that these vaccines are developed, tested, and eventually administered. You all, wrote, you all follow the same medical playbook, folks. And at the same time, you still want to sit there and say, well, it's my body, my choice. I have the right to question anybody I want to. And you're a hospital worker? Oh, no, you're fine. I, I hate to pull a Donald Trump. You're fine. You, you really fine. I, I would, in a heartbeat. Because I can't trust that kind of stupidity. Oh, hey, Brandon, my head hurts from their stupidity. Oh, that, that I, I got one more for that, by the way. But, again, these are hospital people. This all goes back to what I said, um, that this pandemic should be under control. If everybody did what they were supposed to do, this pandemic would be under control. But this is, as it's been said many times across many news outlets, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And again, it is so easy for us to, it, it, if a lot of people started getting these vaccines or unvaccinated, started actually getting them, you would help out tremendously. And I do mean tremendously because again, we need for this to happen. We need for this to occur. But at the same time, what we don't need is more unvaccinated stupidity such as this. hesitant and then you have just i'm not taking it a restaurant owner in california posted signs calling on customers to show proof that they have not gotten the vaccine he's also banned diners from wearing masks inside and put up this massive billboard that says leave the mask take the cannoli of course it has to be an italian guy and he's using the godfather uh Anyway, Tony Roman is the owner of Basilico's Pasta e Vino, and he joins me now from inside his restaurant. Welcome. Man, you said the name perfectly. You said it perfectly. Good job. Now I know you're Italian. It's because I speak the language. Let me guess. You don't. But here's what I'm asking it. you. Tony. I love it. Is this uh, a go. little bit of a joke? Can you, give, can you give me some hope that uh, you really don't want people okay. to not get vaccinated so they can come to your restaurant? That's a good, that's a good question. Uh, you're a smart guy. It's an IQ test. And like I say, say to people when they ask me, if they're so blinded uh, with, you know, with their rage and their hate, I tell them, you know what, if you still don't understand it, uh, maybe we should put up a sign up that says you're too stupid to come into the restaurant. I mean, it's very simple. Just like you said, I think you figured it out. Am I right? I don't even know what you're saying right now. Tell me. We're so what's the deal? Point. I'm saying we're making a point. And so you answered the question. So you haven't been vaccinated. Nobody in your family has been vaccinated. If I answer that, are you, you going to answer that when I ask you? Yeah, sure. Ask me whatever you want. Now answer my question. Uh, I'm not vaccinated. Are you? I, I am. How about your, your parents, uh, your, your wife, your kids? You were hesitant. No, I got vaccinated. I'm going to I, I'm gonna ask you the same. I'm going to ask you the same thing. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. Because you're no. Is your family vaccinated? Yes. See, what you're not, get, what you're not getting, you're, you're, you're failing the IQ test. What you're not getting, which I expected, um, what you're not getting is that uh, this, is not, this is not an anti-vaccine stand. It's a pro-freedom stand. That's what you're not getting. What is the difference when you are ignoring the science that suggests that if you get vaccinated, you protect yourself, you protect the people around you, and you help us get out of this pandemic a little bit faster. So what's next then? Are we all going to lock ourselves in our homes uh, uh, whenever there's a, what, a flu outbreak or, or there's an outbreak of a cold, a common cold? Are we going to lock ourselves in, inside our homes and wear a moon suit? I mean, where does it end? It ends with you getting the vaccine so that this virus doesn't keep replicating and creating variants that we need to find ways to combat. The whole reason this is happening is because people won't protect themselves, Tony. I mean, what are you thinking? Then why did you leave your house when when you had COVID? I mean, you had it and you left your house. I mean, it's been documented. First right? of all, so it has been documented. My ass, it's been documented. Why I quarantined. Why, why I went out. It? My wife got accosted by somebody. I don't know, man. You're and I, I know you don't know, so I'm trying to help you. The science is clear, Tony. You're trying to help me. You're I don't want you, you to get sick the way I was the sick. The science is clear. Oh, you care about me all of a sudden, huh? Enough to have you on the show because I don't like people uh, making bad decisions for themselves and their family. 
I was hoping it was a little bit of a stunt. Oh, okay. You have the freedom not to take the vaccine. Well, I just don't ask, know why you think it's a good move. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe we should ask your brother about protecting people, right? Hey, I mean, look, that's his job. Uh, and if he doesn't no, do it well, whole, people won't that's a whole, vote for him. whole new can of worms. But no, look, Tony, look, I don't Listen, know if you know me too well. My, I'm not shy away my from stand much. is not I'm a political you about stand. You. Yeah, good. I appreciate that, too, because I know you talk a lot. So, so my... My stance here is a pro-freedom stand only. It's not political. You're never going to... If you come down here, you're not going to see a Trump flag flying over the roof, okay? You're not going to see campaign signs. You're not going to see campaign slogans or political slogans ever, okay? Mm -hmm. You're only going to see pro-freedom messages, and that's it. Um, and you're not going to drag me d down the hole talking about the science. It's, this is not about whether I'm pro-vaccine or not. I'm pro-freedom anti-tyranny, okay? And, uh, you know, may maybe the conversation should really be between me and your brother. That, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe so. You're pro-freedom, but people can't wear masks. Tony, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. I gave you a chance to make the case. I wish you well. I hope your family stays safe. I made my case. You didn't have much to say. You didn't have much to say. I mean, so I honestly, you sound you. like an idiot, so there's not much to say. But, Tony, good luck with it. See you. And so do you. Yeah. I, so do you. Only for having you on the show. That was my only mistake. Look, it's just stupid. I'm pro-freedom. I'm not anti. It's not about the vaccine. It's about freedom. What the hell is he talking about? Of course, you have the freedom not to take it. The question is, is it a good move? He doesn't know the science. He doesn't want to know the science. This is my problem with the enablers of guys like this. I hate that he's Italian-American, by the way, because it plays into his stereotype. Look, this suggestion that somehow there is a strength in the resistance to the science, to the mandate, to being told, you don't tell me, I'll do. It just doesn't make any sense. It is such a false sense of strength. It is such a stupid, ethnic, stereotype, masculine, moronic thing. And not to cut Como off, but he's right. He is right in so many ways. Again, um, I don't know what it is. I, I want to say historically, um, there have always been people who just like to rebel, who like to go against, who like to go against the norm. They like to go against, uh, they like to go against the grain, if you will. Uh, in this case, I don't know why. I, I have been literally. It's it's almost because at first I thought when I saw that at first when I thought when I saw this guy's uh, restaurant as far as you know prove that you're unvaccinated I'm like how I mean there's no way there's there I'm just like is there an unvaccinated card somewhere I say hey I'm unvaccinated no of course not there's vaccinated cards out there yeah sure but there's cards out there you get for vaccination to prove that you've been vaccinated yeah that's fine but. His whole restaurant, I'm pro-freedom, but you have freedom. I'm not understanding. Well, we just don't want to be under anti-tyranny, but you're not. You're literally welcoming people in to spread a COVID-19 virus in a closed-off area. But it's about our freedom. Oh, dear God. It, it, I don't know. how. I, I don't see how Chris Como stayed that long in talking to that idiot uh just because and the thing about it is i can't i can't say he's the only idiot there are so many of them out there there are still hundreds there's still millions of people out there who haven't been vaccinated and it's not just your usual trump copies you have people that look just like me that um of different ethnic groups and of uh, genders and and pronouns that will still swear up and down that they shouldn't get vaccinated and it is amazing. I was like, I don't want, I don't want people to finally get sick to realize that I should have did this from Jump Street. Let's use a little common sense. Listen to the science. It's there for a reason. The virus, the, the vaccine is free. The government paid for it. It's almost along the lines of what more do you need to understand for the simple fact of the matter of what you need to do to be vaccinated in order to make sure that your chances of survival are greater. Aside from that, it's like it's this is almost like a cult. And Darwin, and Darwin is winning. Um, but needless to say, guys, with this variant out there, and trust me, with one variant, there's always at least more than one. And I'm not waiting to see what's next behind the Delta variant if this one is worse. If this one is bad, I don't even want to see the next one just because of how potentially dangerous and obstruction it can be. But 
We'll, we'll follow those stories as it goes along. Moving right along, though, I did want to cover this story because this is kind of the thing that, again, I don't know if we're just wondering, you know, people wonder if Trump really did influence stuff. Well, this right here is, again, another reason why this man should not be allowed for president. If anything, he should be tried and possibly jailed. Site committee has just obtained key evidence about former President Donald Trump pressuring the, de the uh, Department of Justice to call the 2020 election, quote, corrupt. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell uh, now. Leanne, what's the latest on this? What evidence did the committee receive? Yeah, Aaron, this is some pretty big news and later or an additional uh, information about what the former president was trying to do to overturn the election results or at least uh, so confusion and distrust in the election. So the Department of Justice sent to the House Oversight Committee some handwritten notes by then acting Attorney General Rosen and acting Deputy Attorney General Donahue, which uh, preview which uh, the notes were about a phone call they had with former President Trump, where the former president tried to uh, convince the Department of Justice to call the election corrupt. And the president at one time said, you don't have to do anything else. Just call it corrupt and I will do the rest as well as my allies on Capitol Hill. So this is just more evidence. While it went to the House Oversight Committee, I am assuming that it will likely go to the Select Committee on January 6th as further evidence to look into what happened on that day in the lead up to it. Aaron. Yes, that Donald Trump um, literally and figuratively sat there and told in a handwritten note to the Department of Justice, call the, call the election corrupt and I will do the rest. If that doesn't sound like somebody that's willing to start to, that's willing to start a coup to stay in power, I don't know what is. It is going to be interesting to see what the January 6th commission does with that evidence. Um, will they move forward and actually start pressing with more pr pressing as far as um, possibly going after Trump? Keep in mind, Trump is already facing a myriad of lawsuits uh, from the IRS, from sexual harassment, and from uh, pretty much people and uh, ducking collectors, uh, co uh, ducking debt collectors. Again, I am just surprised at this point how Trump is not in jail because um, his lawyers must be working uh, freaking overtime. Have to be. Um, to keep this man out of jail. But then again, we will see what happens with the January 6th Commission. And speaking of the January 6th Commission, uh, which brings me to my next point, which again, guys, uh, what is actually I'm about to show, uh, I'm just going to be honest with y'all, um, in so many ways, it is going to be a little on the, how can I put this ever so nicely? It's gonna be on the heavy side. So with that being said, Viewer discretion is advised. Heavy language is going to be used. If you have young ones around you that you don't want them watching this, this is your warning to mute this podcast or take them in the room. Or if you're on a mobile phone or tablet, um, go somewhere else to watch it. Because like I said, it's going to be very graphic about what's about to be said next. You've been warned. At the Capitol, in my entire deployment to Iraq. The writers call me traitor, a disgrace, and shouted that I, I, an army veteran and a police officer, should be executed. I was grabbed, beaten, tased, all while being called a traitor to my country. I was at risk of being stripped of and killed with my own firearm as I heard chants of kill him with his own gun. I could still hear those words in my head today. Several attempted to knock me over and steal my baton. <sighs> One latched onto my face and got his thumb in my right eye, attempting to gouge it out. I cried out in pain and managed to shake him off. One woman in a pink MAGA shirt yelled, you hear that guys? This nigger voted for Joe Biden. Then the crowd, perhaps around 20 people, joined in screaming, boo, f nigger. Another black officer later told me he had been cr confronted by insurrectionists in the Capitol who told him, put your gun down and we'll show you what kind of nigger you really are. 
Ahead of today's testimony, House Republicans defended their decision not to participate in the committee's work. And they echoed talking points from the former president, which he released last night, falsely suggesting somehow that the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was to blame for this attack. Some of the emotional testimony we heard this morning specifically addressed those kinds of efforts by many elected Republicans to whitewash, defend, or downplay the attack in defense of the former president. What makes the struggle harder and more painful is to know so many of my fellow citizens including so many of the people I put my life at risk to defend, are downplaying or outright denying what happened. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. But too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. But nothing, truly nothing, has prepared me to address those elected members of our government who continue to deny the events of that day. And in doing so, betray their oath of office. Now, that's crazy, isn't it? Those the cap those the capital officers, the Capitol Hill officers, um, that were there during the January 6th failed coup d'etat. Um, and the fact that they had to give, the fact they gave their testimony, um, uh, they gave their testimony to the January 6th commission of Pelosi and just Democrats because the Republicans decided that they wanted to put their hands in the sand and pretend like they had nothing to do with it. Now, here's the, also the messed up part. Imagine that you're one of those officers giving your testimony and you receive a voicemail um, well, let's just be honest, it needs to be played. And again, I'm going to go ahead and give this warning that the uh, voicemail is being played. It's an entirety. It is very vulgar. It is very offensive. Again, guys, fair warning. Includes some incredibly offensive language, but we think people need to hear the kind of attacks that these officers are facing right now just for telling the truth about January 6th. Play it. Yeah, this is from Michael Fanone, Metropolitan Police Officer. You're on trial right now, lying and that. Uh, you want an Emmy, an Oscar? What are you trying to go for here? You're so full of shit, you little faggot fucker. You're a little pussy, man. I can slap you up the side of your head with a backhand and knock you out, you little faggot. You're a punk faggot. You're a lying fuck. How about all that scummy black fucking scum for two years, destroying our cities and burning them and stealing all that shit out of the stores and everything? How about that, assaulting cops and killing people? How about that, you fucker? That was shit on the goddamn Capitol. I wish they would have killed all you scumbags, because you, you people are scum. They stole the election from Trump, and you know that, you scumbag. And you fucking, too bad they didn't beat the shit out of you more. You're a piece of shit. You're a little fag, you fucking scumbag. It was, it was important for you. You did not want us to censor that. What do you say to that? What do you want people to know? And that idiot. Uh, I mean, I remember, like, my first reaction uh, immediately after listening to that uh, phone call, which I actually received while I was testifying uh, in the hearing today. Um, this is what happens to people that tell the truth in Trump's America. That simple. That simple. Crazy, isn't it? This was uh, that was supposedly when Officer Freon, Officer Freon was giving his testimony on Capitol Hill. Giving your testimony and you get a voicemail like that. And again, it just, it it's how do you sit there and want to question somebody and then when you hear that? And he, and he said it, and you know what? The funny part was, the, 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 the I'm sorry, not the funny part, the beautiful part about it was, he summed it up so clearly. That's what, you, this is what happens when you say the truth in Trump's America, that his followers of his cult do come after you. Um, but even more so, you would think that not only other news do all new news outlets will carry this, right? You would think they give their opinion, as most do. However, 
let's be honest, Fox News has done what they've done best. Um, basically spin it around and make it somehow about the left. I wish I could make the next two segments up. Wilson used his monologue on Wednesday night to attack a Capitol Police officer who's scheduled to testify at the select committee hearings. His name is Harry Dunn. He's uh, on the left in the video here. Officer Dunn was one of the hundreds of officers who defended the Capitol building and the lawmakers who were inside during the attack. Here we are giving so much and putting our lives on the line to protect democracy and keep it. And we're being called racial slurs, traitors, and any just weapon that these people could use uh, because they were upset about something. We know that uh, there were many officers who were injured that day. He said he would put his life on the line for the people he was protecting. But Tucker Carlson is accusing him of being an angry left wing activist. On Tuesday, Pelosi will call a Capitol Police officer called Harry Dunn. Dunn will pretend to speak for the country's law enforcement community. But it turns out Dunn has very little in common with your average cop. Dunn is an angry left wing political activist whose social media feeds are full of praise not coincidentally, for Nancy Pelosi. Here's a picture of the two of them together. Racism is so American, Harry Dunn wrote in one post, that when you protest it, people think you're protesting America. Hashtag, leave it to whites to tell blacks what is racist. Hashtag, I stand with Elon Omar. Hashtag, squad. Harry Dunn, ladies and gentlemen, just another fact-based witness to the insurrection. He's checking people on facts. Uh, the attorney for Officer Harry Dunn is with us now, Mark Zaid. Uh, Mark, thank you for being here. Um, I wonder first if, if Officer Dunn has seen or heard, read about what Tucker Carlson said, if he has a, a reaction or response. Yes, and thanks, Victor. Unfortunately, it was Harry actually who alerted me to that, whatever one wants to call it. But when we're representing clients, you know, we are out there to protect them and insulate them. So an attack on them is attack on us. And they're gone through so much, uh, not just physical trauma, but emotional trauma. And basically what Tarko Carlson did last night was just to bring, bring another day of attack of January 6th now into what, you know, whatever we are, Jan July. Now again, it's Tucker Carlson, not surprised. The man, the man literally and figuratively makes his, makes his bread and butter uh, off being the, the douche. I mean, let's be honest, between him, Hanny, and Laura Ingram, I don't know who's the bigger douche out of the pot. But, again, I'm not surprised by that, you know, he's downplaying or trying to spin Capitol Police off the Capitol's uh, officer, the officer's testimony um, about that day. What makes it even worse is that not only are you be calling a left political wing activist when you have millions of Trump cultists trying to go, trying to literally will kill you just to get to to break up an election vote. Imagine Laura Ingram giving up the best performance award for you just simply trying to stay alive. Action roll. The winner is. Michael Fanon. Is Laura Ingram giving out per performance awards for your testimony about the beatings that you suffered on January 6th? You know, what's that like to hear that from the likes of Laura Ingram? Um, well, first of all, uh, I've spent quite a bit of time in, in my career testifying in court. Um, and I always felt most comfortable when defense attorneys resorted to theatrical tactics. Uh, because I knew that they no longer had facts uh, to support their argument. And so they had to uh, insult me, uh, insult my appearance, or um, you know, try to uh, chip away at my credibility. But in this case, the facts are the facts. Uh, they're supported by hundreds of hours of videotape evidence, uh, eyewitness testimony. Uh, they're undisputable. Uh, so if they want to disparage me or call me a member of Antifa or talk about my neck tattoos, I couldn't care less. Um, what I do, what does concern me is the fact that uh, 
you know, those entertainers have an audience. Uh, and that audience uh, takes their words uh, and, you know, the rhetoric that they use as more than just entertainment. They think it's real. Uh, and that thought process has real-life consequences. I and mean, we saw the results of that on January 6th. Crazy, isn't it? That, again, I'm not surprised. This is Fox News, I keep telling you guys. Not surprised about them at all. Sean Handy calls one officer a left, an angry left-wing political activist because of his social media. Now, again, your social media is your social media. Um, I say it all the time on my social media. I'm, I would be surprised if I came up in the world and someone came back, looked at my podcast, earlier things that I've said, and be like, well, no, this is what Will said about this this a long time ago. Well, how do you feel about that? I said what I said. I stand behind everything I say. I got no problem. I have no problem repeating something verbatim that I was said on a recorded camera. That's what the podcast are for. So, again, the whole thing of being a an angry left political wing activist just goes to show you that you can be in law enforcement and you still can have an opinion. It is completely fine. It is completely fine to have an opinion. Your opinion has no basis on you surviving a failed coup d'etat by white supremacists descending upon the U.S. Capitol. You could be pro, you could be anti-Trump all you want to, but that doesn't mean that doesn't that does not de, that does not devalue your testimony on that day of that happening. We all saw it. We all saw multiple white terrorists depend, descend upon the Capitol, and they wrecked the place. Broken windows, ran barricades, um, got as close to the Senate doors as humanly possible. If it wasn't for the actions of one uh, one black officer to lead them away, it could have been way worse. So again, it doesn't devalue his testimony at all because he's seen it, he's experienced it, he survived it. But for Hannity to turn around and sit there and say he's an angry left political activist is spin news. Even more so, Laura Ingram, who by far, to me, is probably the most despicable female on Fox News ever, ever, and trust me, she's got a lot of competition, um, turns around and gives the best performance award. How do you, he's like, how do you sit there and you're giving testimony about something that will forever change you, change you. I don't care what no one says. When you go through something like that, it changes you. And he and those officers are now living with that or are having to adjust to life to that. And you have some douchebag over at a news station saying, oh, the best performance goes to you. I'm like, how dare this heifer? I say heifer because I can't say what I really want to say. But how dare this heifer is going to turn around and sit there and say the best performance award should go to so and so. And I'm just, I, it, it's, it betwixt my biscuits. Because that just goes to show you, and, and the officer is right what he said. It's not the fact that these people, you know, are just trying to twist it and trying to make me seem like a bad guy. It's the fact that they have viewers. The fact that they have their own audiences that are literally and figuratively eating all this up and will basically be like a parrot verbatim repeating everything that they say. Oh, you guys are crisis actors. You guys are you guys are left you guys are left wing uh, left wing pundits is what you are. But it's not gonna take away from the fact that Trump did incite a riot. Not only did he incite a riot, he incited, he incited a coup a coup d'etat because he wanted to keep power. And again, it's like going back to the previous going back to the previous story where he told the, the, the Department of Justice, just call the election corrupt. I'll take care of the rest. If that does not sound like somebody that was willing to take power by any means, messing any means necessary, that alone should tell you a lot. Um, but with that being said, though, um, it just goes to show you how vital this January 6th commission is and how the Republicans are reacting. Because if I was the Democrats in 2020 when the midterms come up, I'm bringing up everything that happened with Republicans every inaction, every time they try to skirt responsibility, 
every time they tried to do, you know, they weren't trying to help the people. Every time, you know, if, if I was running for office and I and, and, and if I was going against a conservative opponent, you don't think for one second I'm going to bring up every one of those things? And I will ask that, and I will ask that person who I'm running against, what's your response? Because these are all things you didn't do when you were elected. So why should you be elected again? I thought about running for office sometimes. I was saying, it'd be kind of interesting. But moving right along, guys, I did want to get to the start before we get to the two cop, two, uh, speaking of two uh, cops, uh, two cop cases we have. I did want to bring this up because, again, the uh, black colleges are starting to do something that I'm glad to be seeing. And uh, it is sparking the debate as far as uh, removing student loan debt. I'm kind of hoping about this. Colleges and universities are paying off students' outstanding bills. Yesterday, the City University of New York, or CUNY for short, announced debt forgiveness for more than 50,000 students impacted by the pandemic. The famed Spelman and Clark Colleges in Atlanta are also among the latest pledging to wipe out student debts. But the moves are reigniting a larger debate about student loan forgiveness in Washington. White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks has the story. Um, yes, so I so ran you were that. Yes. Back on campus at her alma mater, Alinda Williams tells me at first she did not believe what she was seeing. I looked and my bill was zeroed out. Just zero, you just zero. It said zero, like I owe nothing. The first in her family to graduate from college, Williams worked each semester on campus, sometimes two jobs at a time. But the bills piled up until last May, right before graduation, when Delaware State University decided to wipe hers clean. What has it meant for you and your family and your mom? It means a lot. It was definitely a weight lifted off her shoulder. One last thing that she had to stress about. You were telling me that you're not sure how you were going to pay that off, the two of you. I was not sure. My mother was not sure. University President Tony Allen has known and worked closely with President Biden for more than two decades. He says it was the money provided to schools through the recent COVID relief legislation that allowed him to cancel more than 700,000 in unpaid bills in May. We wanted to make sure that no senior walked away from here with any debt. Our students come to the university for quality education, first and foremost, but they're also trying to change the economic trajectory for themselves, their families, and their communities. So you can imagine when COVID hit, uh, there was a big concern that that was not going to happen for a lot of them. Delaware State University, one of many historically black colleges and universities around the country, clearing account balances for returning and graduating students. It doesn't surprise me at all uh, that my colleagues have followed suit. Uh, it is the HBCU philosophy. And when you think about the number of first generation college students that come to an HBCU, the number of low resource students that come to an HBCU, this is mission driven what we are doing. These are the things that we are supposed to do. The issue of student loan debt has been front and center this last year during the pandemic. It's estimated that American borrowers owe around $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. The federal government paused payments, but that extension is about to expire, and bills are expected to come due again in September. Wajita Small. Like so many, Dr. Wajita Small has struggled with debt well into her career. At 38, she works as an HR executive, but is still paying down her loans. She's also helping her mom and grandmother. There's a lot of other financial responsibilities that I have that don't necessarily allow me to do things like save or build wealth. When I think about family planning, if you will, you want to be able to afford to have children. And me personally, you know, I've had to put off that journey because I have this debt. I have these other financial responsibilities. While the majority of borrowers took out loans for two or four year schools, Dr. Small says that she needed a PhD to get ahead. Black women, after all, are often paid much less than white men. I have to get my master's and PhD to compete with that individual, whether, you know, similar school, similar, you know, levels of experience, um, but they, they may also have more wealth than I do. So I have to take off the loans. In one of their only public disagreements, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer yesterday again pushed President Biden to extend the pause on federal student loan payments and cancel up to $50,000 per student in public loans. This pause has actually shown how important canceling student debt is to borrowers and to our economy. 
We've heard about being, how, how being saddled with this debt has affected millions of Americans' lives on so many choices that they'd like to make. But the ranking Republican member on the House Education Committee disagrees. It's clear that Senator Schumer cares nothing at all for the taxpayers of this country because it is hardworking taxpayers who provided the funds for these students to go to college. And by the way, 70 percent of taxpayers do not have baccalaureate degrees. So where are they in this equation? The Biden administration has moved to cancel debt for some students, including some with disabilities and others who were defrauded by a handful of for-profit colleges. But there's a debate in Washington over the limits of his authority. And the president himself so far has rejected proposals for blanket loan forgiveness. Back in February, this exchange. We need at least a $50,000 minimum. What will you do to make that happen? I will not make that happen. It depends on whether or not you go to a private university or a public university. Biden has this past year often talked about the wealth gap that in America often falls along racial lines. Activist Shakia Cherry Donaldson says she hopes the president will consider this issue of student loan debt as essential in the fight for racial equality. You can't try to plug one racial systematic hole without acknowledging that there are several more. And I think that this is one of the lowest hanging fruits that the administration could carry out that would drastically change people of color and particularly black women's lives. Every dollar spent on the computer, on the twin extra long sheets, on tuition, on dorm fees, on the meal plan, it was an investment. And not just me, but my entire bloodline, because I would be opening up new paths and new opportunities for the people that come behind me. Women in particular are estimated to hold nearly two thirds of all outstanding loans. The American Association of University Women wrote about the problem, saying that while the amount of debt women initially take on compared to men is not huge, when women graduate, their debt repayment collides with the gender wage gap and the racial wealth gap to make it harder for them to repay their loans. Back in Delaware, President Allen says he's not talked to President Biden about this debate and respects the work the president has done on higher education. I know you said you're not in the business of giving him advice. I respect that. <laughs> but do you have a message for him on this issue? He understands uh, what students like mine go through. And I think he understands that deep in his bones. Remember where you come from and who you've been in the business of serving uh, for so many years um, across this country and make the decision from there. Trust your gut. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. Yeah, so anybody that's ever heard me talk about student debt, I have been saying this a long time ago. Uh, currently, the cumul the the accumulative <clears throat> the accumulated student debt uh, that's in the U.S. right now is a little over 1.7 trillion dollars, and a lot of people are sitting there saying, "Well, we can't afford it. We can't do this. We can't do that." Well, here's the thing that a lot of people kind of forget: um, the two wars in Africa and Iraq and Afghanistan nearly are truth uh, nearly cost us three trillion dollars. So we were able to afford a war on two fronts for nearly 20 plus years that costed us nearly $3 trillion, but we can't spend $1.7 trillion and improve the lives of millions of Americans. Help me makes help and make sense. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and this is one of the things where I say Biden is gonna fall short on because Biden did during his campaign sit there and said there has to be some sort of relief for student loans and things of that nature. And when put on the spot on a town hall, he sat there and said, you know, do you have the power to, you know, do you have the power to wipe away student debt, at least $50,000 of it? I do not. Which, in a sense, he's halfway right. Um, uh, ironically enough, uh, looking at the legislature, there at this time, there is no legislator that says that Biden can't just wipe out student debt there is also nothing in the constitution or current state laws that says that he can't do it he can't he can do it so it's a gray area he supposedly can't but he actually can but he's going on the safe side and saying i can't what he should have sat there and said was well if congress brings it up in a bill i can sign it if congress brings it up in a bill to eradicate student debt i will sign it on the same day it's passed Imagine it. Imagine the pressure you just put because it's true. Um, the House of Representatives can draft the bill. The, the bill can't go to the Senate. Once the Senate. Once the Senate approves it, it goes to the president's desk. 
That simple, folks. But here's the thing that you won't see. And I keep on saying this. For a lot of us, myself included, um, have student debt. And the one thing about student debt is it was based on the saying, it was based on the principle that if you went to college and got a great education, that you can get a great, you can get a pain, you get a great paying job and be able to pay back your loans. Same lie they've been, same lie they've been telling since the 60s. Uh, that, you know, at the time, which was true. I mean, from the 60s and 70s and 80s, going into the 90s, yes, there were great jobs that you can get with a college education with a college education. No argument there. But the problem is somewhere between the new millennium and currently now, um, jobs are not as prevalent in most in most uh, in most areas of careers as they used to be. And with the pandemic, uh, the, the with the pandemic, it it pretty much changed the landscape of jobs that you can get or you should get with a college degree. Because I keep saying this every podcast: the the jobs that we used to have before the pandemic are gone and may never come back, which means the landscape of jobs have changed, careers have changed, um, what is actually profitable is now no longer profitable or it's been reduced or it's been devalued. All of that has changed now. So for the simple fact of the matter is, it's a little bit harder, especially for those with college who are in college or who have college degrees, to basically find the job to offset your student debt, your student loans. And a lot of people say and say, well, I had student loans and I had a job and I was able to pay it. So, so why? So what is What about me? Well, you're going to help these other people out is the most asinine, asinine statement ever, because that's like saying that's like a black person saying there's no such thing as racism. If I was able to be, if I was able to become a doctor, it is the most asinine statement that you can make, because unless you have a score of people that were able to do the same thing you did, then you, my friend, are an anomaly. You are not the, you are, you are pretty much, you are not the exclusion. You are not the difference. You are the anomaly. Because again, with student debt, there is no possible way, no possible way in this day and age with the job market that it is that a person will have to work more than two jobs or have different variances of income or things of that nature in order to succeed. It, that's just the truth. I mean, for example, you could have a bachelor's and master's degree and still not have a job worthy of that um, to offset those student loans. Does that mean that you're a lazy person? Absolutely not. Does that, this means that right now you're a victim of possible, of you're a victim of the current standing of careers and jobs in our country. That's just being honest. So again, when I hear the whole thing about, well, taxpayers don't want to, taxpayers don't want to pay the burden of, of, of paying a whole bunch of loans that folks should never took to go to school. Okay. Again, if you feel that way, if you feel that way, let me point this out to you. Did you want a war? You paid for it. Did you want to bail out the banks? You paid for it. Did you want to bail out the automakers? You paid for it. Do you want to? Did you did you want to pay for the tax breaks that that CEOs like Jeff Bezos and uh, so many others, Oracle, Amazon, Dell, Best Buy, you know that they paid zero dollars in income taxes? Who paid more? You did. You, Mr. Taxpayer, did you get asked anything about your opinions when you were basically when you found out that you were paying more than two CEOs that literally and figuratively went to space not too long ago? That's how bored billionaires are. They literally had a space race that aptitude for nothing, then forgive me for saying this, a dick swinging contest. But at the same time, you want to be mad that, what, over nearly 5 million Americans that have student loan debt simply want a reprieve, simply want to have a break. Because you know what'll happen? Here's what'll happen if student loan debt was reversed. Millions of credit profiles change. Because what does student debt keep people from doing? Student debt keeps people from being homeowners. It keeps them from maybe starting families because let's be honest, uh, you wanna be able to have start a family in a, in a economically suited environment. You don't wanna start having kids when you're both in debt. Um, it can change the way uh, a person's, an outlook. You don't think debt, you don't think the relief of debt doesn't relieve stress. My friend, you have never had debt before. The point I'm simply making out of this is the reason why they won't do this is because, well, number one, 
the old, old argument of just simply put, I did this way, you should be able to do it, or why are we paying for someone else's? It those those arguments are so asinine, but they still carry weight because here's the thing. Nobody wants to sit there and say that someone else had it easier than them. They hate that. They hate the fact of, okay, I had to bust my ass to get past my student loans, but now because you can't do it, I'm paying for it. Yes, and I will sit there and say it equivocally. If, if me paying taxes or paying more in taxes means that someone else who has student loan debt that they may never see the other end out of, if it means that me paying more gets them out of there, I'll pay gladly. Just same way in healthcare, I would pay, just same way in universal healthcare, I pay gladly. I would pay more for I would pay more for others to finally get some relief, to finally get ahead, to finally not worry about the student debt. Because trust me, student debt from a credit profile weighs heavy. Debt to income ratio, if you have a lot of student loan debt, it weighs heavy. So again, I would help. Maybe this maybe it's because I truly believe that. We as an American society should help each other and actually do the right things as far as getting people out of medical debt, getting people out of student debt. I would be more than overjoyed to do my part. But again, student loan debt is real. And I say this all the time that I know that Chuck Schumer, I know that Chuck Schumer wants to push it forward. I know that several Democrats want to talk about it. Even Joe Biden himself um, also sat there and said, well, we should do something about it. Well, Joe, that was on the campaign trail. You're the president now. Let's see what you do. Um, but, you know, you say you can't do anything. It's halfway right. But at the same time, elections, midterm elections, are next year. People remember what you said, Joe. Just keep that in mind. Okay. So, moving right along, guys, before we get to the, uh, to, going to get to our feel-good segment, just a couple more stories got left. I want to talk about these two stories involving the reason why I keep saying police need to be retrained and why defund the police is a real thing. Keep in mind, the next two stories, the next two stories I'm going to show are extremely graphic, so viewer discretion is advised. Aurora Police Chief Vanessa Wilson described the video as despicable, horrific, and not normal, and said watching it had brought her to tears. I'm going to tell you this video will shock your conscience. It is very disturbing. It was early afternoon last Friday, a call for trespassing on South Parker Road. When officers John Harbert and Francine Martinez got to the scene, two of the suspects took off. When they realized the third suspect, Kyle Vincent, had a warrant for a probation violation in Denver, the officers tried to arrest him, and the situation quickly turned violent. Stop fighting! Stop fighting! Body camera video shows Officer Hobart pistol whipping Vincent 13 times, according to Chief Wilson, causing several large welts on Vincent's face. At one point, Hobart also held Vincent down by his throat and threatened to shoot him. On your face. Me. On your face. Me, bro. Vincent was treated and released from the hospital and is now in the Denver jail on that probation violation. Aurora police are not charging him with trespassing or any other crime. How do you think an incident like this is possible? I don't know. Meanwhile, prosecutors have charged Officer Hobart with several counts of assault and Officer Martinez with failing to intervene. At a press conference Tuesday afternoon, Aurora's visibly shaken police chief apologized to Kyle Vincent and to the community and vowed to redouble her efforts to reform the department. We're disgusted. We're angry. This is not police work. This is not the Aurora Police Department. This was criminal. In Aurora. Now, also another bit of news that officer did actually resign, which means that probably criminal cases, a criminal case against him will be coming, and rightly so, because pistol whipping someone and holding them by down the throat for a probation violation actually makes no sense. But then again, you know, this is the reason why I keep saying, officers, we can't have bad apples. 
that man is obviously a bad apple. Even more so, we can't have pedophiles who are basically acting as badges. Um, you'll understand why I say in the next in the next video. And again, uh, your discretion advised. Texas is facing criticism after video shows a deputy on top of a woman pinning her to the ground. The woman who posted this video to Facebook says the woman being pinned to the ground is her 18 year old sister and that she was walking home when somebody called police claiming she was trying to jump in front of cars. A Kaufman County Sheriff's deputy arrived. It led to this in the video that you see there. The woman is rolled over and handcuffed as she's led to the car. An altercation happens. She and a woman who witnessed it say uh, her mother or who witnesses say is her mother are arrested. I've never seen where they, the officer was literally on top of them with his legs wrapped around uh, the back of her, uh, her legs and holding her down. I just, I think again, that situation, he's in a vulnerable situation. Well, that UNT criminal justice professor went on to say the move put the officer in a vulnerable position and heightened the woman's emotions with so many people around. The Kaufman County Sheriff's Office says it is aware of this recent social media post and is currently reviewing the incident. The Sheriff's Office. Now, of course, in that story, where again, uh, someone had called and said someone was jumping in front of cars. Uh, the officer just assumed that this woman was walking by herself and assumed that she was having mental distress. Um, and of course, it's what it escalated and what led to that. Now, there are multiple videos out there on Facebook, even one with the body cam is showing from the officer. The body cam from the officer actually fell off during the during the takedown. But again, it does says a lot that a lot of these officers get into these high stressful situations. But even more so, that was some pedophile ass behavior that he just showed. Because I've never seen an officer that was straddling a woman. That was literally straddling a woman in a position that would make her freak out. I, I understand it completely. Because you're a woman in that position where the man has you there and locks your legs to where you can't move. Oh, yeah. Oh, she's definitely, she's definitely frightened. She's frightened. She's scared. She doesn't know. It's like, you, imagine going through your mind if you're her and that guy's on top of you what to like you don't know what's going to happen next it is completely understandable for her to be terrified um but i also knows that if i become a parent and an officer lays my hand on my child when i'm trying to calm them down and you're sitting there telling me to stop talking to my child and then you decide to strike me when i'm calling my child down i'm gonna go to jail I, i'm gonna go to jail for assaulting a law enforcement officer i already see it coming that's just because that's my child i want to make sure my child is safe i want to make sure that my child um is not harmed especially by police now getting in that was this that was the sister uh that was a sister of the person that was in the in the uh safety vest and all she was trying to do was trying to calm her down it was the whole thing of calming her down because again you have to understand and I, and I can't speak on that. I know I'm, I'm not a woman. I can't speak on this. But I can only sit there and imagine the fear. The fear, the terror. Because that that's what sexual abuse and rape victims talk about. That fear. That, that sense of control taken away from you. The whole time that someone's forcing themselves upon you. And again, when you look at that video of that, de of that sheriff straddling her and telling her to stay calm how do you stay calm when you're on top of somebody like that when someone's on top of you like that how do you stay calm how do you not freak out how do you not because i can like, i keep saying this all the time i see i see why rape and sexual abuse victims have such a hard time coming forward because the trauma of it all that trauma sticks with you it changes you and and that officer, yeah, he should be, he, he should, uh, he, honestly, the way that whole arrest and thing went down, yes, you should not be an officer. You should not be a sheriff. I think he was a sheriff. You should not be a sheriff. Because, again, this is why I keep saying that in the words of law enforcement, things need to change. 
And I and I had a lot of people go, oh, so you want to defund the police? Yes, because what I mean by that is, police should have longer times to be longer training times. For all those that don't know, it takes six, it takes less than six months to be a police officer. You have to you have to be long. You realize that you have to be you have to be in school longer to be a nail technician than you are a police officer. You know, over a nail technician is over a year and a half. A police officer less than six months. Do you know to be a certified master plumber, you have to have ten thousand hours of of ten thousand hours of experience to be a police officer? You got to be six months. It takes you longer to be a master plumber, electrician, contractor, or any other trade, auto technician, or any other trade jobs out there. Those trade jobs require at least two years of training before you're certified. Police officer, six months. Someone who is allowed to protect and serve, who is empowered by the city they live in, who carries a badge and a gun, six months. And the beauty part about it is, you don't go through a psyche eval. You don't go through. You don't go through negotiation tax. You don't go through. Um, you don't go through special awareness training where you can notice if someone is having uh, mental issues or if there are disabilities or things of that nature. You don't go through that training. Every other country in the world has their officers go through training extensively and continuously and gets psycho and gets psychological evaluations to make sure they are fit for the job. America? Nope. And even more so, which actually makes me even when asking even more so, when Biden was pressed about this, saying about the crime rise in America, you know what his you know what his you know what his statement was? We need to hire more cops. And I can't say anything because the same people who were against Joe Biden being president, who kept on shouting about the 1994 crime bill, are now vindicated. Unless Joe changes his mind. But again, I, I will keep saying that the police need to be defunded and retrained. And even more so, not to go back to the Capitol Hill, uh, the January 6th commission, I want to point this out about those officers that came forward and was brave enough to give testimony. Where were the police unions? Where were the Fraternal Order of Police? Where were those where were those union reps that they're a part of come to them and talk or defend them on their behalf? And I cannot take credit for this. Jake Tapper from CNN said it best. He said, Where are all the where are all these police unions? Where's all the Blue Lives Matter folks and all this stuff? Where are they? Their silence tells you everything you want to know. That truly it was all a bunch of BS. Uh, especially in that sense. But the last story I got, guys, before we get to our feel-good segment, it's a little bit about hypocriticism. And I hate to say that it involves Don Lemon. Check it out. Because you may, I never thought I would be in this position to maybe somehow have to defend Tucker Carlson, but we'll see where this goes. I have a mixed emotions about this one. Fox propaganda host Tucker Carlson confronted in a Montana fishing shop called the worst human being known to man. Dan Bailey is the guy's name, posting his confrontation with the TV host to his Instagram and accusing Carlson of killing people with vaccine misinformation and supporting extreme racism. Now watch what happened. I don't care, man. Okay, you are the oh, worst human being. You know man. I want you to do to this to the United States, to everything else in this world. I don't care that your daughter's here. What you have done to people's families, what you have done to everybody else in this world. Don't Okay, so Fox, Fox News reacting in a statement saying, ambushing Tucker Carlson while he is in a store with his family is totally inexcusable. No public figure should be accosted regardless of their political persuasion or beliefs, simply due to the intolerance of another point of view. Well, the store where it happened is called Dan Bailey's Outdoor Company. It issued a, a public statement saying even though that they have the same name, they share no affiliation with uh, Dan Bailey in the video. Again, it was just um, a coincidence that it's the same name uh, and that they treat every customer equally and respectfully. Let's discuss now. CNN political commentators Anna Navarro and Scott Jennings both here. Good evening to both of you. Thank you so much. Let me, say, let me tell you this. I don't like it. I don't like it when people, are, when people do that because I would not want it to happen to me. But I have mixed emotions because Tucker has done this to people before. Tucker said some really nasty and silly things about me. And the next day, there were paparazzi in front of my house. 
hiding, taking pictures. So I don't want it to happen to anyone. I don't want it to happen to Tucker. But when you do things like that, I don't know. I'm just saying that's the real deal. That's how I feel about it. And listen, you know, all of us, we're all on TV. We've been approached. We hear good things. We hear bad things from people. We don't even know who they are. It's part of the gig. Don't you think this went a little too far, though? Um, you know, I, I actually thought the guy who confronted him was quite uh, polite, was not shouting, was not violent, was not aggressive in any way. He expressed his opinion in the same way that Tucker Carlson expresses his opinion on a nightly basis on a much larger platform. Listen, Don, I've seen videos like this about Chris Cuomo when his kids are in tow. This has happened to me. It happened to me at a fresh market in Coconut Grove in Miami. There was this lady stalking me. I thought she wanted a selfie. No, she wanted to insult me for uh, not for loathing Trump. But I don't think that's that should happen to you, Anne. I don't think that should happen to Chris. I don't think it should happen to me no, or Scott. Um, okay, well, uh, um, Don, I, I also don't think there should be hurricanes or there should be uh, COVID. But crap happens, okay? It's, we get well remunerated for giving our opinion, and that comes with good and that comes with bad. To so put on your big boy pants or your big girl pants and get on with life. And look, when it comes to Tucker Carlson, it's not just about infrastructure or immigration or you name it. It's about COVID and it's about life and death. And I think people are very raw and emotional and angry about that in particular. So I think that with the platform we all have, Scott, you, all of us, Tucker, I have, comes the benefit of some people liking what we say and some people not liking what we say. And in the same way I have a First Amendment right, they have a First Amendment right. Deal with it. Yeah, but I want that. your First Amendment right doesn't mean invading my personal space. I'm sorry, Anna. I, do, I understand what you're saying, and I get it. I think that what Tucker says much, much of the time is completely reprehensible and divorced from reality. But he has a right to be in a space and not be accosted and not be ambushed uh, by anyone. You can yell. Look, people yell all the time at me. I was in Cincinnati. There were Trump supporters out there yelling across whatever. They weren't in my face. So if you want to stand across the street, you want to do it, fine. No, there was one person, there was one person who made contact there. And it was Tucker Carlson with the guy. Yeah. The guy never touched Tucker Carlson. The guy never got caught. I, I, I hear you. He gave Tucker Carlson his opinion about what he said. And it is what All we right. have to endure and what we have to deal with for giving our opinion. I hear every you. Night and Tucker has told people if you see someone that makes a kid wear a mask, you should go and call the cops and He's do the for abuse or whatever. Like I get it. And I'm people. Okay, Scott. You know what? If you're going to dish it, you better be able to take it. Scott, uh, Fox News called it an ambush. What's your take on this? What do you think? Well, I agree. It was an ambush. I thought Tucker handled it fine. You know, he, he's been uh, approached before, uh, and, and he usually finds a way to, to diffuse it and laugh it off. I thought the guy actually looked pretty aggressive. He got right in his face. He, he was right up chest to chest with him. He looked like he was trying to move with Tucker as Tucker was trying to get away. And I had this similar reaction to you, Don. I, I don't want this to happen to Tucker Carlson because I don't want it to happen to you. I mean, look, let's be honest. You, uh, by the President of the United States, uh, have been personally singled out. People at CNN have been personally singled out. You know there's a whole group of folks out there who'd love to get in the face or worse of someone here. And there's a whole group of folks out there, obviously, who would love to get in the face or worse of someone at Fox News or MSNBC or, or anywhere else. And so, I was really uncomfortable with this, and candidly, I think to even try to 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 rationalize it, to laugh it off, or to say, "Hey, put on your big boy pants," to me is to condone it. And if you want to condone a confrontation like this, I think basically you're inviting the next one, and the next person may not have the same physical restraint. I, I really think sometimes in these confrontations, Don, you you've met people I'm sure out there who look like they would love to commit violence, and so I just I think when you in, in, encourage these kinds of confrontations or condone it. You know, the next one may not be so friendly and people may lay hands on each other. And that makes me extremely uncomfortable. I don't mind, mind this guy's views. He's welcome to have them. But in a space like that, that Tucker's daughter was there in a small store, it just made me uncomfortable. Oh, well, look, at my my.
Oh, Don. Oh, Don. Oh, whoa, well, Don. You are doing so well. Of course, he's going to sit there and say, well, I'm, it's going to be weird. I'm going to defend Tucker Carlson because someone went, someone basically got, basically was able to see him and tell him exactly what a lot of us were thinking to his face. And Don Lemon wants to defend him saying that nobody has the right to sit there and tell you how they feel in your personal space. Even though Ann Navarro was right. You're a public figure. If you put yourself out in the public, the public will want to reach out. The public will want to reach out and get their opinion of you. At the same time, Tucker Carlson has had a history, and I just showed not too long ago, a history of going after people. So what do you think is going to happen when you go after people and you think no one's going to come after you? And then, and then Don Lemon, of all people, is going to sit there and say, well, I just don't want, I just don't want people to have the ability to literally and figuratively um, come to me, even though they do. Even he admitted it. He admitted folks come to him and say, you know, I don't like you because of Trump, this, that, and the other. And he says, well, I'm, he said, and it's amazing. You acknowledge it, but at the same time, you're a public figure. You're a journalist, sir. People are going to come to tell, people are going to want to talk to you because, again, you're on the news. You're, you're based on CNN every night. You are, you are covering stories, giving opinions that a lot of people may or may not disagree with. You have to understand this comes to the territory. And at the same time, I called Don Lemon a little bit of a hypocrite when he sat there and says, well, you know, not everybody should be approached for the things that they say, regardless if they're a public figure or not. Really? So, um, this YouTube, Don? Story hits close to home. It's a Michigan man. He's been arrested after he allegedly made numerous calls to CNN headquarters in Atlanta, threatening to kill this network's employees. His name is Brandon Greismer, allegedly made 22 calls to CNN on January 9th and 10th. Four of those calls, which were recorded, contained threats, according to the federal affidavit. And there's nothing random about this. Nothing. This is what happens when the President of the United States, Donald Trump, repeatedly attacks members of the press simply for reporting facts he does not like. The president, just this morning, blasting our very own Jim Acosta and calling CNN fake news. A charge he has leveled at the press, not just CNN, over and over. The media is rigged. You are fake news. Yeah, I think the media is the opposition party in many ways. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them. A few days ago, I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. They are the enemy of the people. Sir, do you want people to come in from other parts of the world where there are people of color? Heard from a number of very credible sources from within the White House that you watch this show. You deny it all the time, but then you, you know, say something disparaging about me, and the only way you would know that is if you saw the show. So, Mr. President, I'm going to speak directly to you. We are not the enemy. We are not trying to silence you. It is the job of the free press to report the facts, to ask questions, tough questions, ones you don't like, even if you don't like the facts or those questions. No matter how many times you attack us as fake news, we will continue to do our jobs. When you make that baseless and incendiary charge, be aware that people are listening to you some very dangerous people. According to a federal affidavit, the caller who threatened to kill CNN employees made his threat using these words, quote, fake news. I'm coming to gun you all down. Fake news. I wonder where he got that, those words. And in the second call, quote, I am on my way right now to gun the effing CNN cast down. I am coming to kill you. So I can only speak for myself, but I know my coworkers have also had threats at this network, other networks, other news organizations. There's an open case with the NYPD right now with someone who is threatening to kill me. When you, Donald Trump, tweet 
the post of a train hitting CNN. You might think it's funny. It's not. It's stupid. It's actually childish. My 10-year-old nephew wouldn't, wouldn't even do something like that. When you tweet a doctored video of you body slamming CNN, people are watching. What grade are you in? People take that message seriously. And if one of us has heard, or God forbid, something else in some way or another, because you either don't understand the power of your words and or you don't care, it won't be a fake injury or sadly a fake death, it'll be real. And how will you answer those questions then, not only from journalists, but from our loved ones? Because you're gonna have to do it. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope you see the error of your ways as well. So, Don, I got to point this out um, because one could say you did exactly what that man did in the video. You just did it from your you just did it from your desk. I mean, I could be wrong. Feel free to disagree with me in the comments, but. The same Don Lemon that sat there and they caught and sat there and chastised a man for telling Tucker Carlson exactly what we all think of him. The same man also took time out of his show to address the then president at the time and say, "What grade are you in? This is this is this has been this is terrible. This is the thing. We're not trying to we're not trying to belittle you or things of that nature. You are doing what that man did, although he did it in person, right? Tucker Carlson's face." You did it on prime time. Hypocrite much? I'm just saying. Again, that's just like me. I, I, I mean, this podcast is out to the public. There's going to be plenty of people out there who are going to disagree with a lot of things that I say. There's going to be people that agree with a lot of things I say. There may be some people that look and say, oh, it's a black dude with locks. It immediately cut me off. I expect that. I even expect sometimes people come up to me and say, hey, man, I see your show all the time. I love it. You know, appreciate you doing what you're doing. I've had folks there say, I've seen your show, and I think it's full of crap. Thanks for watching, I guess. But, again, if I put myself out there, and I keep on telling people, this is the reason why we need to stand on what we say. And accept that if we put ourselves out there, especially in a social media standpoint, for the world to see us, this we are going to expect this now i'm not saying you know if you, it's a safety thing if it's a safety thing then get security get a bodyguard i mean you know do some things to protect yourself if you feel so threatened that's understandable but there was nothing in my mind about what that man said to tucker carlson that seemed threatening he just told him you are literally the worst human being in america what you have said the hatred that you spewed has hurt so many people and families and he's right if you are responsible for the stupidity and the dumbing down the year and the idiocracy of America, then yes, you are to blame. And even rightly so that he has a right to go forward and pretty much tell you that to your face. He has all the right in the world to do so. So again, why are you surprised? But again, I could be wrong. Feel free to tell me in the comments. I think that honestly, Woke Don Lemon was being a little bit of a hypocrite um, concerning the fact that he did the same thing to then President Dorito, but he did it from his desk. I'm, I'm saying he's a hypocrite. What do you guys think? Um, but beyond that, um, that's really going to do it as we move forward to our feel good segment because usually on how the fact we got here, we usually cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom. Sometimes just make you want to lose your faith in humanity and realize when the next meteor is going to show up. But what we try to do, guys, because the weekend, and especially if it's in, you're in Tennessee right now, it is a hot plate again. Because all you people pray for summer, and here I am waiting for the long winter night. But we try to leave you guys out on a good note, try to restore your faith in humanity, just leave you with some positive, good vibes. And I hope these next three stories actually do that. I know the first one does, because I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, guys, LeVar Burton will be hosting Jeopardy. Now, for all those that don't remember, or you've never actually, um, or you've never actually, been at your grandma's house long enough to watch anything beyond Perry Mason and He the Night. Jeopardy is actually a pretty good show. I still actually watch it myself um, when I can. But LeVar Burton is guest hosting uh, Celebrity Je uh, Jeopardy this uh, Jeopardy this upcoming week, and I am all for it. 
I really do hope that he gets the permanent job because, you know, Alex Trebek, uh, rest his soul, um, is no longer with us. And so now they're doing a lot of guest hosts for Jeopardy as they're searching for a new host. I think LeVar Burton would actually be a great pick. And I, for one, am I'm looking, I am one looking forward oh. to it. Just because the simple fact of the matter is I am a fan of LeVar Burton. I have been a fan of him since reading Rainbow, um, for all those that remember PBS back then. Um, and also his time on multiple shows, including Star Trek The Next Generation and uh, various other shows that you can remember seeing him on. And like I said before, I think it's great for a guy that he is his main thing is definitely reading and literacy and things of that nature. And I, for one, will definitely be watching it, especially when his shows go live. So I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, the other one that I the other uh, feel good news segment that I got um, I've seen stories like this before, and they're still weird to me. And I say weird to me because simple fact of the matter is, you have a 13-year-old in Australia had found a puffy chip in their Doritos bag, right? This same puffy chip itself, right? Doritos is paying this person $20,000 as a reward for discovering a puffy chip that she listed on eBay. Now... The thing about the eBay, I guess, which was kind of weird to me about the story because the bids reached $100,000. Now, I'm guessing either that um, they didn't pay out or it didn't work out well. But either way, Doritos is uh, paying this uh, individual twenty grand for a single chip. Twenty grand for a puffy Doritos chip. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying great things will happen to great people, but dang, if I knew a puppy chip in a Doritos bag was gonna be worth twenty grand, I would never stop eating Doritos. Personally, I was always a fan of the Cool Ranch. I was never a fan of the Nacho. The, the Nacho was okay, but that Cool Ranch was divine. But I guess that I mean, like I said before, stranger things have happened. But again, twenty thousand dollars just for a puffy chip—that definitely does say a lot. And the last story that I got, guys, again, I heard you guys talk about medical debt. There's actually a woman in Philadelphia who is trying to help people out by simply picking up coins and paying off medical debts. It's a dime. An old dime. Hmm. I've spent most of my life here in Philadelphia. Bingo! <laughs> and it never ceases to amaze me how much change there is in the city. No pun intended. <laughs> Let's walk. You want to sniff? I get up every morning very early and I walk my dogs and we do about four to five miles. I'm trying to find the money, Daisy. Just from keeping an eye on the ground, I just find a lot of money. I have since I was a very small child, but it somehow escalated in the last couple of years. When I put it out in the universe that I was going to give the money to charity, I started finding way more money. Jackpot! <laughs> Crazy! So the charity is called RIP Medical Debt, and it was started by two gentlemen who had retired from the debt collection business. But what's beautiful about it is, with this charity, every dollar is worth $100 in paid off medical debt. Oh, look at that. It makes it much more gratifying to stoop down and pick up a penny, dirty as it might be, because I know that it's gonna go to a cause that is actually gonna be worth a dollar every time I donate a penny. This is what was under the bench. I think people sit here and they drop them. I mean, it can be in a flower bed, it can be around a tree, by the parking kiosks. Not today. Last year's total was $423.82. I'm very fortunate in that I have health insurance, but so many people don't. Even with COVID, there's so many people who find themselves in tremendous debt after long hospital stays. And to be able to help somebody in that way, it just seems like a no-brainer to me. And it's a little thing, but it means a lot. Change for a lot of people feels as if it's not worth anything, but they don't understand that it all adds up. <laughs> Yep, that's they always say, pick up your coins, you never know. I, I give that woman credit, just because, again, she's wanting to pick up change, but she's doing she's doing change for a great cause. And trust me, if you've never been in medical debt, then you will not understand, just like student loan debt, it is a rock around the neck that is a little hard, that is more than difficult to get rid of. And yes, there are several uh, charities out there that are hoping to erase medical debt, um, but I love the fact that this woman kind of just has the right mindset. Just do random acts of kindness for people. I've said it many a times on this podcast and other podcasts, if you have the ability to turn around and make somebody's life great, whether it's a minute, a day, an hour, or a lifetime, go ahead and do so. The world can use more random acts of kindness. We really could because we have way too much stupidity as it is. 
That being said, guys, that's going to do it for this podcast. I do thank everybody that watched, that liked, that let everybody know I was live, that commented. I certainly appreciate that. Um, Oh, excuse me. Before I do get out of here, I do have to do some shameless plugging. I do have to talk about my buddy who also shared this podcast with me. My brother, my podcast brother in arms, Big BZA Dot, uh, has a few podcasts of his own. Uh, you can definitely find him, A. Devon Westwood on Facebook, Big BZA Dot on all socials, as he has Smoking Trailer Sundays, which is the trailers of videos and movie games every Sunday from 6.30 to 9 p.m. He also has the RAF, which is like America's Funniest Home Videos, some done by Worldstar, every Tuesday from 6.30 to 9 p.m. Also, for any new uh, shows and a Announcements, please check him out, A the Bob Westpoon on Facebook or Big BZA dot on all socials. Now, as for me, of course, the link at the bottom, you copy and paste that into your browser, will take you to my link tree for all the Facebook and YouTube groups for all of my podcasts, How the Frack We Got Here, Get Bit, and of course, the Offense Podcast, my actual IG handle, which is right here in red. I'm getting better at the finger placement now. Um, Blackbox447, you can find me on IG. You can definitely follow me there as I do post uh, various stories, gym stuff, uh, movie reviews, things of that nature. So definitely like, like and follow me there, guys. Um, Aside from that, podcast itself still hasn't changed. Uh, we did uh, we did just did have our Get Bit podcast uh, last uh, Friday night, uh, yesterday at eight thirty. Of course, um, a little bit later today, there will be a pre recorded version of the Optimus podcast, and I can't wait to do that one because I think it's going to be very near and dear to my heart that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and of course. Like I said before, if you know somebody that likes this kind of stuff, this type of news, because I do believe news is informative, but it should be said in a way to where it's clear cut, where it's informative, that we're not trying to push anything upon you. We're just trying to allow you to make up your own mind. Let people know about this, because I would love to sit there as I'm trying to branch out and try to get interviews with politicians. Yes, that's going to be interesting. Um, and I hope to actually get them in the future. But like I said, uh, like I said, if you like it, let people know. If you didn't like it, still let me know. I still want to know what you guys think, whether you love me or hate me. I still love all of y'all most of the time. But um, aside from that, guys, the last thing I'll say before I do get out of here, uh, like I said, COVID-19 is real. The Delta variant is real. It is beyond time now that we should honestly be thinking about uh, if you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you're, you know, take precautions. I'm like, even now. Like, I have a mask that my girlfriend made that I love to death because it has the Optimus Prime Transformer on it. And I, you know, again, uh, uh, Little Creations by little creations by K on Facebook. But um, I love the mask that she does. And again, now that we're back to mask, guess what I'll be doing today? Masking it up. Even though I'm vaccinated, we still have to do what we can to protect ourselves and each other. Because if we start doing that, which we were so close to doing... Um, that we can mask up, that we can vaccinate, that we can do the precautionary things that we need to do to lower the ICU counts, to lower the COVID case counts, because that's how we prevent, that's how we beat this pandemic. We all have to step up and get vaccinated and mask up and really protect ourselves. It is honestly that simple. That being said, guys, last thing I'll say about the last, the only thing I got to say last, the only last thing that didn't that that was a terrible segue. So the last thing I gotta say about how the fact we got here, it's all about staying informed. We're not trying to change minds, we're not trying to um, persuade opinions. We are simply doing what the news stations of old try to do, which is basically uh, just give you all the information and allow you to make up your own mind. We do a lot better as society when we're informed. We're informed, we're progressive, we can move forward, we can finally break barriers and make changes. Um, for example, electing our first Madam Vice President who is black. Still hoping for Michelle Obama in 2024 and hope she changes her mind. Aside from that, guys, thank you all for watching. I certainly appreciate it. And if you're watching this on the playback, please comment if it's live. I still want to know you guys' opinions about everything we covered. Uh, aside from that, take care of yourselves and each other, and we will eventually beat this and get through this. Peace.